morning, everybody. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Mark chapter 2. We've been going through a series um, that we've just titled Discovering Jesus, um, asking who is Jesus of Nazareth and what difference does it make in our lives? And uh, today we'll be in uh, verses 18 through 22. So I'll read it as you turn there. Mark writes, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. People came and asked him, why do John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the groom is with them, can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new patch pulls away from the old cloth, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost as well as the skins. No, new wine is put into fresh wineskins. Last year, I read a book by uh, John Steinbeck uh, called um, Travels with Charlie. I was like really trying to just read books for fun, you know, not like for work. And so I was like, this one ought to be good. And so it's a story about John uh, traveling around with his dog, Charlie. They travel all across America uh, to try to find the true America, like hear stories from actual individuals. And um, in it, he travels back to his hometown, which was in California, south of San Francisco a ways, I believe. And he hadn't been back for a while. And once he gets back, he is a little disturbed because it wasn't like he remembered it. Things had changed. There were buildings where there used to be beauty. Uh, you know, now there were malls where there used to be a field. There used to be uh, landscapes of mountains that are now interrupted by buildings. His friends were no longer there like he had remembered. Everything had changed. And it was the only part of the book that I underlined. Again, I was just trying to like do something just for fun, the fun of it, not for anything else. Here I am quoting it though. Uh, but it was the only part of the book that I underlined because it really struck somewhere deep within me like a deep place within me where I really resonated with that. Because I think we all can relate if we ever go back to the place where we grow, grew up. You know, I go home and I'm like, where are all my friends? Where are all my high school buddies? When do we have basketball practice? Like, let's get going. And none of them live there. And I'm also 12 years out of high school or something. But the reality is just like, that hurts. I don't like the change. I want to be able to go home and everything to be the same, like I can just pick right back up off uh, from where I left without skipping a beat. And I don't like change, especially when it's something that I hold dear, that I have cherished memories around, something that I really value. And research says that I'm not the only one. You know, we are actually, many of us are resistant to change, uh, at least in some parts of life. Some of us are so spontaneous, we live for change. But at least like the things that we hold real value in, we, we don't like change. It's part of being human. And psychologists will talk about the, the comfort of the familiar, where our brains are actually wired to seek safety and predictability, where familiar uh, places and routines and patterns provide a sense of security and comfort. And so any deviation from that can trigger uh, discomfort or it's seen actually as a threat. It's this, this uncertainty. And so whenever change comes, it can evoke resistance because our brain perceives it as a potential threat on a pattern or a system that we find security in. And that's certainly not a bad thing. I think it's how we were made and especially for our kids, like to have structure and predictability is an important thing. It's helpful for their development. It's important for their well-being. And, but the amygdala in our brain actually interprets any change as a threat and releases hormones for fear or fight or flight. So your body is actually trying to protect you from change. So resisting change in life is part of being human. You know, it's hardwired into us by God, for, and it's a good thing. Um, but no wonder John's disciples and the Pharisees' disciples were so resistant to change. 
This scene is right after, if you remember from last week, right after Jesus and his disciples feasting with tax collectors and sinners. And now these, John and the Pharisees' disciples come up to him and said, we're fasting, you're feasting. Why aren't you following our traditions? And we are talking about traditions here. There, there was a command for a certain time to fast in the Old Testament for Israel. It was the Day of Atonement, where they were commanded to rest or Sabbath and to deny yourselves or fast. And, but any other occasion beyond that was not a bad thing, but it was just tradition. And it, it was, again, not a bad thing, but it wasn't a mandatory thing. And Jesus certainly is not against fasting. If you remember from chapter 1, he fasted for a long time. And he is for fasting. And the church has a long, beautiful tradition of fasting. It's useful. It's valuable. It's important. It's a way of abiding. It's a way of trusting God. So what's the deal here? You know, I love traditions personally. I remember growing up and we'd always have uh, Christmas at my grandma and grandpa's house. And my grandma, we call her Nana, she was the Christmas queen. Like she made just a huge deal out of it. And it was like a tradition I grew up with every year. And then when my grandma passed away, things changed. And it was actually really sad for me to see a tradition that I valued so much as a kid change. Or the same could be true of other holidays, 4th of July, anything like that. Or Taylor and I are talking about like traditions we want to make with our kids. We have a, a day on the calendar we call Huckleberry Day. Like every August, we're going to go pick huckleberries as a family. We'll probably last five minutes or so. Um, but I love having predictable things to look forward to. Like to have something on the calendar every year to know what to expect. You know, sometimes to a, a fault where something is just so familiar, I, I go back to that thing over and over again even when it, does, it isn't serving its purpose anymore. Like, I'll go back to a hunting spot over and over again, because like five years ago, this was a really good spot. And I just go back because it's familiar. But the reason I went there in the first place now no longer matters because there's no elk there. But I'm just like so, you know, romanticized about this perfect spot. And so I end up going back. It's a tradition. And it's a tradition that no longer is serving its purpose anymore in this time. What was one time very effective or helpful has expired. And so for this confrontation with Jesus, fasting is still good and important. And Jesus does it. He's just saying it's not the right time. Does it have to be a certain day of the week? Is it okay to feast instead of fast when the bridegroom is here? And they are upset at Jesus' disciples and their leader because there's a change. There's a change. These guys are exercising freedom from their traditions. Jesus and his disciples are exercising some sort of freedom of conscience that the Pharisees and John's disciples just cannot understand. So Jesus gives them three illustrations to try to prove his point. A wedding, clothing, and wine. First, a wedding. Jesus said, The wedding guests cannot fast while the groom is with them. Can they? As long as they have the groom with them, they cannot fast. But the time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast on that day. He says, the guests cannot fast while the groom is with them, can they? And I read that, and I'm like, yeah, they could. Like, I don't, I mean, if they wanted to, right? But, lost in translation, weddings weren't just a a day. They were the seven days, these seven days of festivity, which, which sounds so fun and expensive. Um, if you're a dad of a little girl, which I am, who's not allowed to get married, and we digress. But, um, but you weren't, in that tradition of a Jewish seven-day long wedding, you weren't supposed to fast or mourn or work. It was a time dedicated to celebrating, to being festive, to spending time with the, the groom. Jesus is saying it's not time to fast or mourn. That time will come, as he hints towards the cross, While I am here, it's time to celebrate. Like a Jewish wedding, it's time for joy. Time for the groom and the wedding party to celebrate, not mourn. Let's let's feast, just as he had just done. 
where fasting was a way to, and is a way to deny yourself and open yourself up to God, but they aren't realizing it's God himself standing right there in their midst. They're trying to honor God by fasting, all the while missing the God-man, Jesus, literally right in front of their face. So he gives the image of a wedding. Next, clothing. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new patch pulls away from the old cloth and a worse tear is made. Now, I'm no seamstress. I know we have a few in the building, so you can verify with them. Uh, But even I understand this. If you tried to patch an old pair of jeans with a new piece of unshrunk cloth, it's going to rip uh, if that piece isn't pre-shrunk. And I don't know about you, but I cannot stand Shirts that are not pre-shrunk. Like, what's the point? You have to size up. I literally put this on this morning, and I was like, this either shrunk or I got taller. I don't know, but the point is, if you sew a, a new unshrunk piece of cloth on an old piece of clothing, it'll rip and tear and make it worse than it was in the beginning. Lastly, wine. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost as well as the skins. No, new wine is put in the fresh wine skins. So wine being contained in jars or wine skins, uh, old wine skins that had already been used were, uh, had already been stretched to their capacity. And so if you put new wine in an already maxed out container, it would expand you know, as the wine fermented. And so it would tear, it would burst. He's saying the new and the old don't mix. And I think the main point of all of these three illustrations combined is that the time, he's saying the time has been fulfilled and Jesus is inaugurating the new and all the old was leading up to it. He's saying that he, he goes on to say all the law and the prophets were leading up, pointing to him. And now he's finally can't come and they're missing it. And they're still so caught in their traditions, they're missing the whole point of what their traditions were for. He has come. In the language of Hebrews, that was just a shadow of the good things to come. Warren Wearsby says this on this passage. He says, Jesus came to usher in the new, not unite with the old. The Mosaic economy was decaying, getting old and ready to vanish away. Jesus would establish a new covenant in his blood. The law would be written on human hearts, not on stones. And the indwelling Holy Spirit would enable God's people to fulfill the righteousness of the law. This was tradition. Their disciples were about tradition, and they were likely about tradition uh, in a pompous sort of exterior public show sort of way where they were doing these things but missing the point. They're doing all these external traditions to pursue God and don't realize God is right there in their midst. They're going through the motions, but they're missing the point. They were offended by Jesus' disciples' apparent freedom of conscience that they had. Paul picks up on this theme in Romans 14, which is a fantastic chapter, chapter, but just one verse says, One person judges one day to be more important than another day. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. They were self-righteous, looking down on Jesus' disciples for not following their traditions. But, I mean, you can be kind of sympathetic, right? For years, things had gone a certain way, and they lived according to certain customs and traditions that they thought valuable. Then this Jesus Messiah guy comes along and doesn't follow protocol. So in in some ways, like, I, I get it. I understand why there's this resistance, but they were holding their traditions so tightly that they were missing the opportunity that was standing right in their face. Truth is, we often do the same thing with our traditions or with our preferences. We hold such a tight grip on them. But the reality is we, these things, traditions that are good, we need to hold them loosely. And I think what happens in the church a lot is we actually kind of moralize or dogmatize what's actually a preference so a lot of the things that we fight for, that we hold so dear, in the end, they're not law by God. They're preferences. They're not commands. And God gives a, a lot of freedom in life 
and in the church and in ministry. He gives us certainly a lot of commands, a lot of guardrails, but where there is freedom, we should be slow to make a rule, slow to dogmatize or moralize what is actually a preference to us. But really, again, that's hard to do because, again, we don't like change. Change threatens our sense of security. We perceive it as a a threat, and we immediately focus on the negative of maybe what was lost rather than the potential gain of the future. Uh, One psychologist, Dr. Rich Hansen, suggests that, quote, our brains are like Velcro for the negative. We just see the negative of what we lost. And Teflon for the positive. Now, I'll be honest with you. I had to Google what Teflon (laughs) was. Uh, But if you don't know... Uh, if there's somebody in the room that doesn't know, just in case, um, it's, it's like, a, uh, oh shoot, somebody help me. It's, um, you like, it's on pans, it's like a coat, non-stick surface thing, whatever, let's move on. Okay, I have to Google it again um, for next service, which we don't have. But um, the point is this, I'm so sorry, the point is this, we're afraid of change. The new is scary. It's unknown. It's sad. We mourn the glory days, the thing, uh, what once was. And we are comfortable in our traditions. We just are. But when we think about it, is our security really in tradition? Is that out of like (laughs) everything we could pick to find our security in? Is it in tradition? Is that what we choose? While new things can feel like a threat, our true security must lie in something much more robust than just traditions, than than just what's familiar. Even Jesus had to embrace change and was in some ways, you could say, resistant to it. And it was harder than anything we will ever go through. Matthew writes in his account that Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and he told the disciples, sit here, Well, I go over there and pray. Taking along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. He said to them, I am deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and stay awake with me. Going a little further, he fell face down and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus embraced change that our experiences as important as hard and hard as they are, don't hold a candle to. Jesus left glory to put on flesh, to be slain on a cross. And you think that was his preference? I mean, he's praying for, God, is there another way? But in the end, he went through it with it. Why? It wasn't his preference. Crucifixion, No thanks. Is there another way? But he did it to save the lost for the joy set before him. His love for the lost, his love for the Father was greater than his love of comfort. Jesus let his preferences take a back seat to what needed to happen to save lost people. And he trusted God's will because his security was not in his preferences. His security was in the Father. And again, change in our life is probably nothing near extreme as that. But it's still difficult. But we need to ask, where does our security really lie? Often our security lies in what we are used to rather than in God. And these things that we're talking about, tradition, you know, predictable patterns, stability, routine, those are all really, really good things, helpful things. Again, important for children to have structure, know what to expect. But ultimately, our deepest security cannot lie in our traditions or what's familiar because those are extremely fragile things. I mean, we live in a world changing at such a rapid pace. I feel like I can't even keep up. And I'm one of the youngest people in the room. Like artificial intelligence, Uh, the internet, iPhones, I feel lost and I'm 32. Life is just changing so rapidly that that's such a fragile place to put our security. And we can't stop these things from happening. Our security must be in something much more robust, something that doesn't change, 
even though the world is changing faster than we can even keep up. Psalm 16 says, Lord, you are my portion and my cup of blessing. You hold my future. You hold my future. That's true of you as individuals. That's true of us as a church. God, you hold our future. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? Elizabeth Elliot wrote, where does your security lie? Is God your refuge, your hiding place, your stronghold, your shepherd, your counselor, your friend, your redeemer, your savior, your guide? If he is, you don't need to search any further for security. Where does our security lie? Again, it's so easy to know the right answer and it to not penetrate our heart at all. We can be hardcore Christians, but as soon as like life goes unplanned, we live as atheists or agnostics at best, like it's all on us. We don't really trust that our security, that he holds it in his hand. If resistance to change is a fear of lack of security, then the solution is to trust in a greater security something much more robust. The truth is when I find myself so anxious or like becoming micromanagey or resisting new ideas, it's because deep down I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid things aren't going to go the way I want them to. So I try to, you know, control the situation, uh, control all the variables. In fact, I try to be God. I'm not living human size anymore. I'm saying I'm all powerful. I can control and manipulate all these things. I'm sovereign. Trying to take the place of God, that's what it is. When we don't trust God, not just here, but in here, we try to be God. We try to control things. We try to be all-powerful. And it destroys our soul. It exhausts us. And it fractures our relationships. But when I can actually trust God with the future... And these moments are few and far between. When I can actually trust him with my heart, to the unknown, the outcomes, I can rest and I can appropriately live as a human being, human-sized. You know, a lot of uh, firstborn kids, I'll just use mine as an example. Grayson was our firstborn, and he's kind of the, you know, your stereotypical firstborn, like a little more rigid, has his preferences, uh, a little more particular, and he tries to control everything. And uh, it's probably our fault, you know, because firstborn, you know, parents, you don't know what you're doing. Like you and the kid are kind of all figuring this out together. Uh, we're so anxious. Is he breathing? Is he breathing? And, then, you know, Emmett, we don't even know where he is half the time. We're like, ah, he's probably fine. Uh, but already I'm trying to correct the lie in his mind. I'm like, buddy, you don't have to try to control everything. You're five. You can trust me, you can trust mom, and we have your best interest in mind. And the reality is we're all, we're all just large grown-up toddlers, aren't we? Trying to control all the variables, trying to resist God doing something new because we don't actually trust him. Or we trust him with the big things. Anybody else? Salvation, all that. Oh, yeah, easy to trust him but not the small thing. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? When you think about it, that you will trust God with your eternity, but you won't trust him with the smaller things in the present. If he holds our future, then we can trust God and embrace the change that he brings. If God is in control and knows what we need more than we do, both individually and as a church, then we can rest and trust in him and we can welcome change in our lives. Not, and I'm not talking about stuffing feelings or denying the opportunity to grieve, but to be sorrowful yet re rejoicing in trust, anticipating what is yet to come, straining forward to what lies ahead. We can trust in the security not of traditions or what's familiar, but him. And realize that even the Son of God had to embrace change. And he did so for our good. Keeping open hands to what God wants to do in a new season 
in a church like our situation, um, in a new generation, a new time, it's always hard and it always has been. There's a story in the book of Ezra where 40 to 50,000 Jews come back to Jerusalem from captivity in Babylon uh, to rebuild the house of the Lord, to rebuild the temple. How do you build anything? I don't know, but I think you start with the foundation, I hear. So in chapter 3, they complete the foundation. But listen to this, starting in verse 11. They sang with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love to Israel endures forever. Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and family heads who had seen the first temple wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this temple. But many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouting from that of the weeping because the people were shouting so loudly and the sound was heard far away. What a mixed bag reaction to an amazing accomplishment. The younger generation is cheering shouts of joy. That old temple had been destroyed, and now the place of worship has been restored. But the older generation is weeping to the point where the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shouts from that of the weeping. And why were they weeping? Because they had seen the first temple. They had seen the first temple. And they might be thinking, ah, this one's not going to be as great as that one. This one, uh, this wasn't going to be totally the same. You know, this is great and all, but the last one, we had this and this and this and this. And this still plays out today. Ask almost any church that has lasted through multiple generations. Now, I I think it's so important in this scenario and in um, any scenario, in our scenario, for the younger generation to realize that they are standing on the backs of the previous generation. And to, to bring it close to home, I am so grateful for you and especially you that left the comfort of Missoula Alliance Church under like the best pastor ever, Jeff Valentine, to take a risk to plant a church on the north side of town. You know, I I come in here and I'm like, I didn't build this thing. Uh, I didn't go through the sacrifices of starting this church. I don't even know some of the sacrifices that you guys have made. But still, generational differences around the the church or the temple or or worship or whatever, it's not a new thing. It was happening in the book of Ezra. And there's a story, speaking of Jeff Valentine, I think he's the one that told me this story where A.W. Tozer, who was a pastor in the Alliance, I call him the poster child of the Alliance, um, he, he, when they were shifting from hymnal books to overhead projectors, he threw a fit because he thought we need to be holding a hard uh, copy, hymn, not Bible, not this, okay, hymnal in our hands. So he was freaking out about an overhead projector. At that time, that was probably real. That was probably a really difficult transition. So it happened in the 20th century. It happened in 400, 500 BC with the temple. And while it's important to grieve the past, we can also miss what God is doing in this new season and wanting to do in our future because we're just trying to hold on to the past. The importance is that God was being worshipped among the next generation. Not how the temple looked similar or different. The younger generation is cheering shouts of joy. Isn't that what we all want? In order to make room for the new, you do have to grieve the old. Jesus talked about this concept of, of without death, there not being life. In John 12, he gave this, he said, um, Truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains by itself. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Now, he was talking about himself, but he was also giving a principle that we have to stop trying to bring back what has died and instead be able to grieve what was lost. But like a grain of wheat, if it dies, it can produce much fruit. Part of dreaming a new dream is letting an old one go. You know, I want, to, I want you to think about this. 
Think about the best steak you've ever had. Okay, you got it. You're salivating now. Um, sorry, we're almost done. But uh, think about the best steak you've ever had. Maybe it was at, you know, 1889, you dropped like 300 bucks down there, or you went to Lolo Creek Steakhouse, or maybe you made your own on your own grill. I don't know. You got it in mind? Remember the cut. What was it? What cut was it? Remember the flavor, the tenderness, the juiciness, how it was cooked. Hopefully not more than medium rare, for the love of God. Okay, you got it in your mind? What was the plate like that it was on? Do you remember the plate? What was it made out of? Porcelain, perhaps? What color was the plate? How thick was it? What shade was it? Was it like an off-white, a little grainy? You don't remember, do you? You know why? Because it's not about the plate. You didn't go to the restaurant because, hey, I heard this plate place is really expensive. They got really nice plates. No, he went for the steak. The plate was just an instrument for the main thing, which was the steak. It's just a, a vessel for the important thing. It's not about the plate. It's about the steak. The plate can change. As long as the steak's good, that's what matters. A mission, uh, often we get hung up on models more than mission. Preferences more than mission. And, and you see Paul do this uh, all throughout Acts. Not that, but the opposite of that. Where he, he <clears throat> purposefully and so strategically changes the plate depending on the situation he's in. The meat is still the same. The gospel is still the same. But if you even go and compare Acts 13 to Acts 17, same gospel, totally different presentation. One, he's talking to a Bible-believing, mostly Jewish audience. He talks about Israel and the history. Then Acts 17, he's talking to a more pagan context. And he quotes their poets and starts just with this whole idea of God before even getting to... Christ. Change in form is not a compromise of substance. The mission of Paul did not change, but the model did. And again, the problem is <clears throat> we all moralize preferences. We all moralize plates, to put it that way. And, but we miss out when we're, we're so obsessed with the wine skin, not the wine. We, we miss out when we make it about the tradition and not the mission. And now all of this, I'm, I'm just, I didn't plan <laughs> this passage, it just came. And, but I want us to think about this as a church, for us as a church. What does that mean for us? Our job is to make disciples. And you guys have been through a huge transition, those of you that have been around for a while. And I personally, I'm so proud of the courage you guys have had to want to see this church continue when you didn't even know what the future held. You're already living this out. But we are at the beginning of a new chapter, a new season, a fresh start. What are we going to do? Do we try to recreate the past or the glory days, that, those things that are familiar? Do we step out and in trust into a fresh new beginning, even when it's uncomfortable and even when it goes against our preferences? We shouldn't be asking, hey, what, what did we do 20 years ago or what was really impactful to me as a kid and try to tape that on to this church. We should be asking, God, what do you want to do in this church, in this neighborhood, in this time of history? And to be open to new models, even when it goes against our preferences. You know, I want to show a graphic. Um, if you want to put that slide up, if you can. Um, this is our neighborhood that the church is in. And uh, it's so uh, reserved to Broadway, to um, to that road right by Hellgate, I forget what that's called, and to Mullen. So they're just in that rhombus, whatever, who cares? Okay, uh, interesting. And this was, in, this was from 2022, so a year and a half old, depending when it came out. But 
9,419 people just in this neighborhood. I imagine it's somewhat higher now with all the development and new apartments, all that. 4,100 housing units. That's not on that slide, but let's go to the next slide. This is the population age pyramid. I don't know if that's surprising for you. To me, it kind of was. The largest demographic in this neighborhood is the 25 to 34 year olds. The second largest would be at 13.9% is the 35 to 44 year olds, right above that. Third would be down the 11.8%, 15 to 24 year olds. And then if you added the bottom two, so five to nine and 10 to 14, they give the same uh, age gap. It would be tied with 45 to 54 at 11.3%. And uh, the reason we look at that is because that's where our church exists. And as much as important as it is for us to, yes, be inwardly focused, to equip the saints, to grow in maturity, to grow more and more in, uh, into the image of Christ, we also need to be looking out and saying, God, what is the mission field you have placed this church in? What would it look like to be good missionaries in this area? You know, we always send missionaries across the globe, um, and they spend so much time learning the culture and how to contextualize in a way that gives them the best opportunity for God to work through them. But here in the U.S., which is gravely different from what it was 50 years ago, even 10 years ago, we don't really think that much about it. We don't really think about how could we best contextualize in this area and this more post-Christian world that we're living in? Are we willing as a church to, over time, if things, if need be, to pivot, to try things, to selfless, selflessly give up our preferences for a mission, to be part of God's mission, that it's not about the wineskin, it's about the wine, it's not about the plate, it's about the stake. It's not about methods or traditions. It's about the gospel, and it's about the mission that he has called every believer to. And if we, looking at that data, if we have to tweak things or do things differently as a, as a church family to reach that demographic, I hope that we can willingly surrender our preferences about the type of plate that we're serving the stake on. I'll end with this. Worship team, you can come back up. Isaiah 43 says this. Do not remember the past events. Pay no attention to things of old. Look, I am about to do something new. Even now, it is coming. If Jesus is who he says he is, then he is deserving of our trust. And we can be open to the new works that he is doing in our life, in our church, in our city, because our security is in him, not in a tradition or a method or a plate. And we can, as a church and, as, and in individually, strain for what lies ahead and trust that he is always doing something new and he has prepared good works in advance for us to walk in. Would you pray for me as we enter back into worship? Father, I just feel such a tremendous amount of holy ambition, um, weight, anticipation of what you're doing in this city and what you're doing in our neighborhood and all the people that you're sending here. I just pray that we would be flexible and open and trusting in you. God, that we would just keep our hands open and willing to do whatever you call us to to make disciples in Missoula and of all nations. God, and that you would knit us together as a church family and that we would see your kingdom come in, in this world, in this state, in this city, and in our neighborhood. And we look for you and the power of your spirit, God, that you are working already. And our job is not to make something happen, but our job is to walk with you, find out where you're doing, and participate in it. And it holds our hands open and say, God, whatever you will, not our will, but yours. It's in his, his name we pray. Amen.